Hello again. Great to be back here on Thursday. Uh, diving into God's Word together. Let me remind you of our prayer meeting this evening at 7.15 on Zoom. Details are in the email for you. If you've not been on before, then let me encourage you to come and to join with us this week. Can I just do a wee plug and a wee reminder uh, that we're looking for some uh, actions to some of the children's songs. It's in the email as well. You don't need to have uh, children in your family to do these. Uh, we'd love to have some adults involved in it as well. Uh, but if you do have children, uh, then, then please let me encourage you. Uh, the next couple of days, uh, look at those videos, record them for us and pop them to me or to Rebecca so that we can pull them together and use them in the coming weeks together. This morning, we dive back into uh, Philippians and let me just read Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 11, although we're only going to think on the first four uh, today. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. God's word for us today. A few simple thoughts for us. We Christians love our labels, don't we? Uh, sometimes we judge each other uh, by the labels we wear. Two men once met on a plane and uh, one man asked the other, are you a Christian? Yes, I am, came the answer. Oh, wonderful, said the, uh, the first man. After more conversation, he asked, are you a Protestant, Catholic or Orthodox? I'm a Pro Protestant. Uh, that's great. Uh, so am I. The questions continued. Are uh, you a Calvinist or a Minion in your theology? I'm so happy to say that I'm a staunch Calvinist. Uh, that's fantastic. So am I. If you don't mind me asking, are you a Calvinistic Baptist or a Calvinistic Presbyterian? I'm a Calvinistic Baptist. Oh, what a coincidence. I'm a Calvinistic Baptist too. Are you a Northern Calvinistic Baptist or a Southern Calvinistic Baptist? Well, by heritage and choice, I'm a Northern Calvinistic Baptist. Unbelievable, replied the first man. So am I. May I ask you, are you a Northern regular Calvinistic Baptist or a Northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist? I'm a Northern conservative ba Calvinistic Baptist. This is truly astounding. There are only 200 of us in the world and two of us happen to have met on this plane. Tell me, sir, uh, would you uh, happen to be a Northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist Convention of 1844 or a Northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist Convention of 1868? Well, I'm of the 1844 bunch. This is a miracle, the first man declared. He had only one further question. Are you a Northern Calvinistic? Are you a Northern Conservative Calvinistic Baptist Convention of 1844 King James Version or a Northern Calvinistic Baptist Convention of 1844 New International Version? I am a Northern Conservative Calvinistic Baptist of 1844 New International Version came the reply and with that the first man ceased to smile. Die heretic, he shouted. We laugh, we giggle. But sadly, many a Christian falls out with one another over our trivial matters. Of course, there are matters that are worth holding dear to. The substitutionary, atoning death of our Saviour on our behalf, for example. But there are many more things that we need not split hairs over. Unity is a precious gift of the Spirit. It's to be prized, it's to be sought, it's to be guarded at all costs. 
Paul understood this well and spotted some signs of potential struggle and discord among the believers in Philippi. As he starts chapter 2, he speaks of unity and encourages the believers that united we stand. We see here the resources for unity, the requirements for unity, and then the results of that unity. The resources for unity are found in the four if statements found in verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, he says. We're reminded here of what God has done for us. He has united us with Christ. He has loved us and cared for us. He's poured his grace on us and saved us. He's given us the precious uh, gift of his Holy Spirit. Let me break that down just a little for us. Paul begins with our union with Christ. He points us straight away uh, to our Saviour and Lord. He reminds us of our salvation, of entering into a relationship uh, by faith with the Messiah. When we come to know Jesus as our own personal Saviour and Lord, we enter into a relationship with him and we are united to him. And because of that union, we take encouragement knowing that he is always with us. Our love for the Lord ought to create a burning desire to serve alongside fellow believers in unity. Then he reminds us of the comfort of his love. The Greek word is literally consolation of his love. When we were lost in sin, the good shepherd came to find the lost sinner and showered his love upon us. We did not deserve that love, but God gave it to us anyway in Christ Jesus and so when we have a strained relationship and think that that person does not deserve our love, let's remember how Jesus acted, uh, how he loved us while we were yet sinners. Paul then speaks of our fellowship with the Spirit. When we came to believe in Jesus, we instantly received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us and leads us and guides us. The uh, Holy Spirit draws us into fellowship with God and with other uh, believers. And that's an important thing to remember. The fellowship of the Spirit helps us with our relationship with God, but also with other believers. It was John who wrote in 1 John 4.20, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. In any conflict, with another believer, I must rely on the Spirit being at work within me to help ease the friction with that person. The Spirit is another great resource for unity. And of course, the fourth resource for unity is the grace of God. Paul says that at the end of uh, verse 1, if any tenderness and compassion. That's translated in the King James as any bowels or mercies. In the English Standard Version as any affection and sympathy. It refers to the emotional, emotional element in God's love. God looked at us when we were lost in our sin and by his grace he loved us and saved us and redeemed us. God the Father could have looked down and uh, noticed our rebellion against him, our ignoring of him. And he could have said they've made their bed, let them lie in it. But he didn't. He was filled with tenderness. And compassion. He chose to have mercy on us and by his grace we are saved. May we never forget that as we deal with other people. The ifs of verse 1 express truths that the Philippians would readily assent to. Yes, they had been encouraged by their union with Christ. Yes, they had experienced God's love. Yes, they had enjoyed the fellowship of God's spirit. And yes, they had received an outpouring of mercy from God. Well, then, says Paul, in light of all of that, it shouldn't be such a great thing to ask you to maintain that unity that God has given you. And the underlying principle here should be noted. All Christian duties flow naturally from God's kindness to us. It's not as if God says, do this and I'll bless you. But rather, I have blessed you. Now go do this. The resources. We then find the requirements for unity in verse 2. And these are threefold. We see here the shared mind, the shared heart, the shared purpose. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. We are to be like-minded. 
That is to be sure and certain of the fundamentals of the faith. We are to agree on basic Christian doctrine. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, so that God alone gets the glory. We should agree on a, a shared statement of faith and live that out in practice. We ought not to major on the minors, as that story I shared at the beginning highlighted. But equally, we must not minor on the majors. Good Christian doctrine matters. Some are guilty of de-emphasising those in our day, so let's make sure that we guard against that. Stick to the truth that you know. We have the same love. Love for Christ, love for one another. We are to know, to experience, to share the love of Jesus. That love of Christ is revealed in his incarnation and his death, as Paul goes on to illustrate in the following verses in our next devotional. It's a love that yields its rights for the sake of others. Christians must have that love in mind in every relationship. And we are to be one in spirit and purpose. We are to be united in effort. United in goal, united in purpose, united in desire to demonstrate God's love and action. Uh, what is our goal in life? To know Jesus and to make him known. Uh, the Westminster Confession reminds us that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We are to exalt Jesus. We are to uh, lift his name high. We are to witness for him, tell others all about him. Paul said it back in uh, verse 27 of chapter 1 that we thought on, on Tuesday. Stand firm. In one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. If our focus is on Jesus, then everything else falls into place. The resources, the requirements. Notice lastly, the results of unity. And there are two here in verse 3. Verse 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. We will have a new attitude toward others and a new attitude toward ourselves. There'll be no more selfish ambition, trying to get all we can, be the best of the bunch. This particular word in verse 3 is sometimes translated as factions or strife. It speaks of a competitive spirit that destroys unity by dividing the church into groups and into cliques. And how easily that happens. No more vain conceit. That's arrogance. Picture a balloon full of hot air and you've got the right idea. It speaks of those people in every church who are full of empty ideas loudly spoken. Rather, we are to humbly consider others better than ourselves. We're not to look out for our own interests, but to look for others too. We're speaking of true humility here. It means to have a proper estimate of yourselves so that there's no need for self-promotion. We will go on to read how Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Word became flesh, the Word who created all things, humbled himself before his Father and saved his creation. Jesus it was who wrapped that towel around his waist and got down on the ground and washed the feet of his disciples. We will remember who we are. And will humbly serve others. Quite simply, we're speaking of joy and being together. Jesus first, others second, you last, joy, Jesus, others, you. Paul is keen for the church in Philippi to be united in love and purpose. For the believers to be united together. He centres this on Jesus and all he has done for them. He calls for them to work at having a shared mind, a heart and purpose. And the consequence of this will be a new attitude towards self and others. Friends, this word is for us too. United, we stand. Unity is a must within the church. Without it, we will accomplish little of lasting value. Where unity exists, the church prospers. Unity motivates and dictates our actions. And this unity is founded in our shared love for and faith in Christ Jesus. May our love for him motivate us to love one another and to serve him together. May we have the same mind, heart and purpose. And may we together continue to demonstrate God's love in action. United we stand. Let's pray. 
Loving God, we want to thank you for your incredible grace, your mercy and your love. We thank you for Jesus, for his great example to us. We thank you for his love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the wonderful gift of your spirit. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be united uh, in purpose, united in love, united in all that we are called to do under Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to hold on to what matters, to hold loosely that which is secondary in nature. Lord, help us together to look to you, to cling to you, to work for you. Help us to bring glory to your name. Lord, in these days of isolation, of separation, help us not to grow apart. But Lord, help us through all the means that we have to grow stronger together, that we might continue to be united in love and purpose, that we might share that with others. Father God, we pray again today for those who are working on the front line. We pray for their protection, whether that be in the health service, Lord, whether that be in some of the essential shops and services that are around, Lord, we just pray for them. For all who are continuing to work, Lord, many from home, we pray that you would just continue to guide them, help them to be motivated at home in that different environment, not to be distracted so easily. Lord, for those not working just now, furloughed or not able to work for a variety of reasons, Lord, we just ask that you be close to them and watch over them. Lord, for children at home, young people, maybe finding these days that a little bit more difficult, Lord, uh, allow them to keep in touch with friends, friends within the church and out with the church. Help them to look to you as well. For all of us, Lord, from young to old, we pray that you would continue just to be with us, to give us a measure of health and of strength in these days, to lead and to guide us in all that we do. We thank you again for your love. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Continue with us through this day, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great <clears throat> to be in God's word again. Some great words to come uh, next week uh, as we continue in Philippians. Uh, but for today, go and ponder these a little bit more and apply it to uh, your life today. And I hope to see you tonight as we meet on Zoom to pray together at 7.15. Have a great day.